Welcome back. How often have you picked up the Quran and just couldn't follow because the English translation was so old and outdated? I've certainly come across this challenge over the years as I try to understand the Quran. Today, we'll talk to a pair of translators who tackled this very issue. Dr. Mustafa Khattab completed a thematic English translation of the Quran entitled The Clear Quran. Dr. Khattab has completed his PhD in Islamic Studies in English from Al Azhar University and is a Muslim adjunct chaplain at Brock University. Joining him is the editor in chief of The Clear Quran, Abu Isa Webb. Imam Mustafa Abu Isa, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. So, uh, you know, um, we've got you guys on here to talk about the Clear Quran. And I have to ask you, you know, online nowadays, there is a plethora of resources available. So what um, caused you guys to sit down and say, okay, this is something that we have to do? Okay, I'm going to start. Uh, it all started uh, three years ago. It was uh, August 2013, and I was a visiting imam in, uh, at the downtown uh, masjid in Toronto. Okay. So that day was a Juma. And after I gave my khutbah, I was dressed up nicely like this, mashallah, with the turban. and So Friday prayers, right? Yes. Okay. So I was going home. I, um, I took the cab, and uh, the cab driver was not Muslim. So, uh, you know, he could tell that I was Muslim based on my clothes. So uh, he said something out of the blue, and he said, Muslims are good, but Islam sucks. I said, okay, why are you saying this? He said, because your Quran, your book, calls me an animal. I told him, I'm Hafiz, I know the whole Quran by heart, and it doesn't say that anywhere. And he said, this is what his translation said. Uh, so it was basically an ayah from Surah Anfal, chapter 8, uh, verse 55. Mm -hmm. So that night I went home. There is a website called Islam Awakened, and they have a section on Quran. And for every ayah, they give you 35, 40 different translations. And the man was right. Most of them said animal or beast. Very popular translations. So that night, I said, you know what, I'm going to do my own translation. I knew that some of the translations uh, had issues, but I didn't know that it was that bad. Uh, there is something uh, also I wanted to add. Before 1905, the Quran was never translated by a Muslim. So after that, there was a flood of translations. Um, so sorry, up until 1905, it was, who was translating it then? Non-Muslims. Okay. So it was never translated by a Muslim into English before 1905. So the first one who translated it was Dr. Muhammad uh, Khan from India, Pakistan. Mm -hmm. But most of the translators who did the Quran from the Muslim community after were not qualified in Arabic because most of them were not uh, native speakers of Arabic. Uh, they didn't study translation um, and they were not uh, like specialized in Islamic studies and Arabic studies. So sometimes mm -hmm. they missed the whole uh, point when they translated. Mm -hmm. And Abu Isa, how did you get involved uh, and why was this a priority for you as a publisher? Um, well, at the time when, uh, when Imam Mustafa first approached me about this project, I wasn't yet a publisher. I was a, I was a writer and an editor um, and a convert to Islam. So uh, as a convert, I, I had experienced what he was talking about from the other side. So mm -hmm. um, when I first started studying Islam, I was only uh, 17 years old. And I tried to find a translation of the Quran, and I uh, was living in rural Alberta, and y I couldn't. Uh, the internet was kind of a different creature back then, so it didn't really. Uh, there weren't any resources online either that were that were easy to find. Uh, when I finally did find a translation of the Quran, I found myself, even as a young, um, as a young high school student, realizing that the translation couldn't do justice to the original because what I was reading was hardly you know, um, I couldn't really understand what it was saying at all. Mm -hmm. So how could two billion people follow something they can't understand? Yeah. So what I did, um, and I still have this collection, I had a collection of Qurans, and every time I read a verse, um, or any time I did anything, I did the same thing that the Imam was talking about, I would go through like six translations and try and get the sense of what it meant. Uh, not realizing at the time that even doing that, um, even if you go through six or 40 translations, uh, you still might miss the point. Um, once I converted to Islam and began studying the Quran more in depth, uh, I realized the full extent of this problem. So when, uh, when the Imam approached me with this, I was already on board. I was already thinking this is definitely something that needs to get done. Obviously, this is a massive undertaking based on you know some of the challenges that you guys are talking about. I know I experienced that myself. So walk me through a little bit about the process because this sounds like you know even in your own experience you had six translations and you were still there are times where you still miss the point so how did you guys even begin so what we initially did uh, well Imam Mustafa initially made a translation 
um, that, uh, that, that covered uh, the, the, the basic meaning. But then we wanted to take it through um, not only uh, the standard, you know, translate each word, but also make sure that when people read it, that they understand the meaning. Mm -hmm. um, so what we initially did was we took that translation and we sat with a number of, uh, of, of editors, uh, three editors, uh, sorry, two editors and the, the imam, and we, we went through what he had done and we sort of picked apart some of the key issues. A lot of the times he wouldn't fully translate, he would say, here's five words. Uh, that kind of have this meaning, um, and what's the best word that we can use? Um, so we would go through and we would make these decisions. Sorry, five English words? That five English words okay. that carry a mm -hmm. general meaning about this Arabic word, which is the best one. Uh, we would look at where does the English word come from, what are some other meanings related to it, where else have we used it in the translation, um, and then we would come to an understanding. But that wasn't it. We would then take it to another editor, uh, who, outside of the influence of our ideas, would read it and decide what he thought of it, send feedback uh, back to uh, Imam Mustafa. Then we would take it to a large group of people and um, we would read it and ask them what they thought of it. What did it mean when we said that? Because sometimes, from an academic point of view, you use the correct English word, but yeah. because the popular, popular use of the word is different, people bring out a different meaning um, that sitting you know, in your office uh, you don't think of but then it's abundantly clear when everyone says, well, this is what that means, and you have to change it. And uh, what were some overarching, you know, we talked about, you guys mentioned, you know, challenges about using the right words and that kind of thing. So what were some of the overarching, I guess, principles that you followed when you were doing your translation? You said, okay, this is, these are the four or five key areas that the translation should address. Well, I told the team from the very beginning, uh, we don't need a translation. We need what I call translotion. So we explain that a little okay. bit. Okay, trans lotion, like okay. the lotion. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. <laughs> what do you mean by so that? So we <laughs> wanted something that doesn't uh, sound like a translation, okay. something that is genuine and unique. So when you read it, it will reflect the beauty and the power of the Arabic. Um, so when it reads, for example, about a storm in the ocean or the sea, like in Surah 10, Surah Yunus, then you feel like you are with them on the ship and the waves are coming toward you. So we use powerful words. So you'll see words like overwhelming, words like tremendous, mm -hmm. big words, but understandable. Uh, so we made sure that four things are there in the translation. And this, I think, what makes the, the clear Quran stand out as a good translation. Uh, clarity, number two, accuracy, eloquence, and flow. Mm -hmm. So this is why in the last uh, two revisions of the translation, we had a room full of people, Muslims, non-Muslims, old, young, men and women, uh, and Abu Isa would read the translation out loud to see the flow. And I don't think this is something that was done before. And also we had uh, very fantastic sisters who were involved. More than half of our team were sisters because it's uh, 2017, as uh, Trudeau <laughs> says. <laughs> Perfect. Now, um, you know, this is great. Now, I want to show our viewers a little bit about what the Qur'an, the clear Qur'an, actually looks like. So can one of you, I know we have books, so can you share with me what the structure is um, in, the, in the Qur'an? Because I think it's very different than what right. we normally see. Uh, we, wanted to set the, we wanted to set it apart a little bit. Um, we wanted, obviously, to, to integrate with the, the tradition of Qur'an and Qur'an translations. So we have, you know, the cover is recognizable as a Qur'an cover, and it sits easily in, you know, masjid mm -hmm. bookshelves and things like that. And uh, s similarly, the interior, we wanted to do justice to the book as well. But what we've done that's slightly different uh, to improve the flow and to improve uh, readers' ability to understand is um, Imam Mustafa has actually divided up uh, sections based on, uh, based on a number of different uh, criteria so that uh, small sections of the Quran can be understood um, in context with one another so that um, it becomes easier to read more quickly what's happening and it becomes easier to, uh, to understand that each verse has its place. Uh, and you should, you know, you don't have to start from the beginning of the chapter, but you should at least start from the beginning of the idea mm -hmm. uh, when you're reading through. Uh, Can the you sections. share an example? Because then off air we were talking. Um, if there's anything that you can share, a relevant verse that you think readers can relate to. Uh, yeah, sure. We have um, from Surah Kaf, we have uh, a verse. Um, and again, this is, uh, this is a section uh, that's entitled Judgment Day. So we've, uh, we've composed this. Uh, we've set together these verses um, 
because they all relate to, to the same idea, and reading one of them uh, doesn't give you the full impact. Mm -hmm. So I'll go ahead and read the, uh, the entire section. And this is from uh, Surah Kaf, which is uh, chapter 18, and it's verses 47 all the way down to 49. And it says, Beware of the day we will blow the mountains away, and you will see the earth laid bare, and we will gather all humankind, leaving none behind. They will be presented before your Lord in rows, and the deniers will be told, You have surely returned to us all alone, as we created you the first time, although you always claimed that we would never appoint a time for your return. And the record of deeds will be laid open, and you will see the wicked in fear of what, what is written in it. They will cry, Woe to us! What kind of record is this that does not leave any sin, small or large, unlisted? They will find whatever they did present before them, and your Lord will never wrong anyone. It's very nice that it's easy to understand compared to, you know, regular translations where it's more old English. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, I want to uh, circle back to, you know, your initial uh, rationale about why you started um, this endeavor, and it was because of that experience you had with the cab driver. So can you tell me generally, uh, or maybe share one example of uh, a verse in your opinion that historically has been misunderstood and you reworked it a bit? to okay. help, help understand. So for example, a verse that is always mistranslated in the Quran is in chapter 21, verse 87, mm -hmm. Surah Anbiya, uh, where it says, So almost everyone says that uh, when Jonah, the man of the whale, uh, when he left his town in a rage, thinking that Allah has no power over him, so it is not acceptable in, a, in Muslim belief to think that Allah has no power over someone. Yes, this is one of the meanings in Arabic, but this is what you get when you look up a word in a dictionary, mm -hmm. right? That Allah has no power over him. But what it means actually, and this is used in many places in the Quran, Allahu yabsutu rizqa liman yasha wa yaqdir. Allah gives abundant or limited provisions to whoever he wants. So here it's used in the sense of restraining. He left in a rage thinking that Allah cannot restrain him mm -hmm. and put him in a tiny place like the belly of the whale. Yeah. So this is what it means. Also another place where the uh, context is misunderstood in uh, chapter 53, ayah 27, <laughs> Everyone says that the disbelievers of Mecca at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, they uh, gave angels female names. So okay. my question is, name one. Mm -hmm. None. All the angels are called uh, Jibreel, uh, Malik, okay. uh, Mikael, yeah. but none of them is a female. But what happened, the people of Mecca at the time of the Prophet ﷺ were categorizing or labeling angels as the daughters of Allah. Mm. So it's a label. Okay, it's they don't give that. them individual names as females. I think, you know, these are very good examples. Just as we wrap up, if there's one thing that you guys want, one or two things that you want people to take away from the clear Quran, what would it be? Or what are you hoping people take away from it? Um, one thing, actually, in, in our process that we did, uh, to, to make sure that we did a proper translation, we would uh, do some, some research into what we had accomplished. Uh, we would, uh, like I was saying before, um, read it out to people and ask them what they thought of it and make sure that was correct. Another thing that we did though was we would time people. Um, how fast can you can you get real meaning out of mm -hmm. out of this book? And uh, with in the case of the Clear Quran, people often are able to read it twice as fast and still get more meaning out of it than uh, another translation. This goes back to your question, what do I want people to get from this? I want more people to be reading the Quran and reading more of the Quran. Mm -hmm. If it can reach more non-Muslims, because it's easier to read, then that's a benefit. And if Muslims find it easier to read and can read more of it, then that's the benefit. The Quran is a literary miracle that was given to the Prophet and I want people to, to, to see the beauty and the power of the Quran. And I want people to, to be connected with the Quran, Muslims and non-Muslims, uh, uh, to, to grow in faith or to learn something new about this faith. And where can people uh, get a copy of the clear Quran if they're interested? Here uh, in Canada, there's a number of stores that carry it. It's at Salam Shop, it's at Moda. Um, many of the Masajid have copies and they have copies for sale. Uh, and then we're also distributed internationally. Uh, Farqan uh, in the United States uh, distributes. Uh, and if uh, non Muslim viewers want to access it, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, it, you can find all of the information on our website at sirajpublications.com and then just scroll down to Clear Quran and there you go. Perfect. 
Thank you very much for coming on and sharing, uh, you know, such an insightful conversation. I know I definitely learned a lot and definitely hope our viewers can benefit. So thank you both. Thanks thank for you. having us. Hey, YouTube, we hope you benefited from this video. If you liked it, or if you didn't, let us know in the comments below. And if you're interested in learning more, check out some of our other videos. And don't forget to subscribe so you can get new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday.